The history of free energy hidden. Perception is a business. Perception. Get up 
nice and close like that. It's hard to tell where the motherboard ends and the city begins. There's uh, the electrical mass harnessing atmospheric electricity. Taking alternating current and converting it into direct current. They tell us. <laughs> Tell us, right? Hopefully, it's yeah, uh, electric city. Electricity. Electric city. They're all set up like motherboards to harvest and conduct energy. Throughout history, energy has been abundant and free. It's been harvested by ancient civilizations at a certain point there was a catastrophe a mud flood and all of this technology was buried but there were a few survived and walked away with this knowledge of free energy. Earth is a simulation. Energy being harvested. The plan ET. show you guys how similar motherboards are cities when they get up nice and close like that it's hard to tell where the motherboard ends and the city begins
is not up. Earth is not down. Earth is not a globe. Earth is not a plane. Earth is a motherboard and an electrically generated simulation. friends and welcome to a new happy learning video today we're going to talk about some animals that existed 65 million years ago I am sure you have heard about the dinosaurs and I'm certain you have seen them in many films and cartoons featuring dinosaurs but not everything that is told in these films is correct so if you don't mind, let's find out what they are really like and how they lived. The first thing we need to understand is that people and dinosaurs never lived together. The dinosaurs lived before human beings existed and they roamed the earth for approximately 135 million years. That's a really long time. They were the dominating vertebrates. Nowadays, more than 500 different species have been identified thanks to bones and fossils found. All dinosaurs were oviparous, meaning they reproduced by laying eggs. But there were huge differences between them. Some were very small, while others were absolutely enormous. Who was the better inventor, Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla, and why? The better inventor was hands down Edison. He had so many patents and inventions. Our best hope for induction in wireless charging is Nikola Tesla, and I hope that'll be the way of the future. I'm on Edison's team. I am on team Tesla. Edison, Edison rocks. rocks! I'm on team Nikola Tesla. Tesla, Edison, I mean, it's a great question. When you look at innovation and you look at competition and you look at rivalries, I think it is that type of um, competitive spirit that drives us forward. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla are two different types of inventors. Edison really was a businessman at heart. You really had to dig into the nuts and bolts of whatever it was you were inventing so that you could make it into a commercial, marketable product. Edison's breakthrough was to conceive of this as not just the light bulb, but as a system. Nikola Tesla has developed technologies for the transmission of alternating current electricity, which brought electrical power to households. He brought to light wireless communication information, which is part of the foundation for how we communicate on a global basis now today. I like both Edison and Tesla. I think they were pretty fantastic scientists and inventors. I suspect because there's controversy, they must be pretty close to equal, um, and that's exciting. A lot of people want to know who was the better inventor, Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla. And I have to say neither one, because they were so different as inventors. Tesla and Edison, they're just both great inventors in the energy space. And what we're seeing sort of in lighting and electric motors is just another huge wave of innovation. I'd like to toast the rivalry and toast both of them. Hello friends, today we'll learn about fossil fuels. 
Fossil fuels are formed from the remains of ancient animals and plants buried deep inside the Earth for several years. The three main types of fossil fuels are coal, oil, and natural gas. These are the result of the decomposition of dead animal and plant matter buried deep in the Earth's crust. These fuels are then pumped from underground and used in a number of ways. Oil. Oil is a thick black liquid. It's called petroleum. It's found very deep inside the ground, usually between layers of rock. To get the raw oil out, a large well is dug. The oil is then pumped out of the ground. It is carried in pipelines and large tanker ships. A refinery changes the raw oil into various products like gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel. It's also burned in power plants for electricity production. The oil is burned, which produces gases that turn a turbine to create electricity. Secrets from the Great Pyramid of Giza continue to unfold as scientists discover we can focus electromagnetic energy through its hidden chambers. RT's Trinity Chavez explains. Built by the ancient Egyptians more than 4,500 years ago, the ancient Pyramid of Giza is the oldest of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But scientists are becoming more and more astonished as they make new discoveries about this mysterious landmark. Archaeologists in Egypt have stumbled upon a new discovery. They found that its shape focuses electromagnetic energy, such as radio waves, through its hidden chambers and under its base. Its ability to concentrate electric and magnetic energy was discovered by an international team of researchers led by scientists from ITMO University in the Russia city of St. Petersburg. According to it, These are the Great Pyramids of Egypt, literally man-made mountains of stone. They were incredibly difficult to build and costly for an ancient civilization like Egypt. And this raises the question, why build structures of this size and of this shape? Some of the answers may lie in religion or politics, but the extraordinary thing is that pyramids aren't unique to Egypt. All over the globe, people have constructed these towering triangular monuments. There must be powerful reasons why this form appears again and again throughout history. What is the significance of the pyramid's shape? And does their similar design mean pyramids were all built for the same purpose? Teotihuacan. Along the Avenue of the Dead, multiple structures show evidence of a catastrophic fire that consumed portions of the temple complex. The damage has been attributed to an uprising at the end of the 6th century, just before the population entirely vanished without a trace. This structure in particular, in spite of the many modern restoration, still shows evidence of the devastating fire that consumed the city. 
the pattern of destruction seems to be mostly concentrated around areas along the Avenue of Dead and around the main pyramid. According to archaeologist Leopoldo Botres, who surveyed the site in the late 19th century, the damage seemed too extensive to be attributed to simple torch flames, leading researchers to explore alternative explanations. Many explanations included the possibility that the ancient inhabitants of Teotihuacan were harnessing energy. This caused a sudden energy release that resulted in this devastating fire. Could the curious finds of mica and mercury at the site help corroborate the theory that the burn marks we see along the Avenue of the Dead are from some sort of mechanical explosion. I'm Samantha Deitcher for Investment Pitch Media. Free Energy International, symbol FEE on the TSX Venture Exchange, has completed the acquisition of Durrell Media. Shareholders will be pleased to see the shares back trading after the company requested a halt in August 2013, pending news. Durrell Media has developed a cause-driven online marketplace designed to bring shoppers, businesses, and charities together to provide opportunities to buy and sell, while bettering the community with each transaction. Consumers create buy requests for the product or service they're looking for and share them to get more like-minded individuals to request the same thing, or they can browse by category. Those buy requests are matched against the profiles of participating businesses and sent to them to make offers on and fulfill the demand. Revenue is generated when a transaction between a buyer and seller actually occurs and is considered a listing fee. The parties to a successful transaction recommend an eligible charity, and Durrell Media subsequently donates a percentage of its revenue to the respective organization. Free Energy acquired 100% of Durrell for $725,000, which was paid through the issuance of 14.5 million shares at a deemed price of $0.05 cents per share. The idea that civilizations progress from a primitive state to a more advanced one is a fallacy that evolutionists try to apply to history. If one abandons evolutionist nonsense and prejudice and looks at the historical references and findings with an unbiased mind, what one encounters is civilizations that used highly advanced technologies. Remains left from ancient Egypt, the Mayans and the Sumerians indicate the branches of science such as electricity, electrochemistry, electromagnetics, metallurgy, hydrogeology, medicine, chemistry, and physics were used to a considerable extent. Electricity was efficiently generated and widely utilized in ancient Egypt. The Baghdad battery and the first arc lights were used at that time. felt very, very excited because no one was expecting such a massive thing inside the pyramid, which was not in any kind of theory. It's a high energy kind of electron. They are able to go through stones. of stone. They were incredibly difficult to build and costly for an ancient civilization like Egypt. And this raises the question, 
why build structures of this size and of this shape? Some of the answers may lie in religion or politics, but the extraordinary thing is that pyramids aren't unique to Egypt. All over the globe, people have constructed these towering triangular monuments. There must be powerful reasons why this form appears again and again throughout history. What is the significance of the pyramid shape? And does their similar design mean pyramids were all built for the same purpose? So just doing a little uh, stargazing tonight. Getting in a positive space. It's important to do that. There's a lot of negativity, a lot of negative charge. And so I am um, dancing with the stars. <laughs> thinking more about them being um, schematics in the sky. All the constellations, all the lines that connect all the stars are misdirection. If we connect the dots a little differently, they are schematics for technology, architecture, free energy. And what a great place to put schematics and the stars they never change so you get your blueprint right there for all generations to come
my desire, if not my duty, to try to talk to you journeymen with some candor about what is happening to radio and television. And if what I say is responsible, I alone am responsible for the saying of it. Our history will be what we make of it. And if there are any historians about 50 or 100 years from now, and there should be preserved the kinescopes of one week of all three networks, they will there find, recorded in black and white and in color, evidence of decadence, escapism, and insulation from the realities of the world in which we live. It opens a valve and it lets air through the pipe. So it's a constant volume for that pipe. So the swell shutter pedal, which is controlled by the feet and it's right above the pedal board where I play the notes with my feet. And as I push the pedal forward, the swell shutters will open. And as I slowly push it close, the swell shutters will close. And so it's connected by electric wire from my foot all the way up to the top of the swell box to open and close the shutters. So the stop tabs on the organ each tell me what family and what the size of the pipe is. So there's 8-foot flutes and 16-foot flutes and 4-foot reeds. And so I know what to turn on for what sound that I want. And the more of those that I have down, the louder the sound is going to be because the more pipes I have playing together. And the fewer is when you get the purity of an individual sound. And so the organ has these great big chests that fill with air and they're waiting for me to, to press these notes. And then they activate and as I hit the keys, all of these things open up and it just lets this air rush out into the pipes. Secrets from the Great Pyramid of Giza continue to unfold as scientists discover we can focus electromagnetic energy through its hidden chambers. RT's Trinity Chavez explains. 
stupa to ancient Egyptians more than 4,500 years ago, the ancient Pyramid of Giza is the oldest of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But scientists are becoming more and more astonished as they make new discoveries about this mysterious landmark. Archaeologists in Egypt have stumbled upon a new discovery. They found that its shape focuses electromagnetic energy, such as radio waves, through its hidden chambers and under its base. Its ability to concentrate electric and magnetic energy was discovered by an international team of researchers. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla are two different types of inventors. Edison really was a businessman at heart. You really had to dig into the nuts and bolts of whatever it was you were inventing so that you could make it into a commercial, marketable product. Edison's breakthrough was to conceive of this as not just the light bulb, but as a system. Nikola Tesla has developed technologies for the transmission of alternating current electricity, which brought electrical power to households. He brought to light wireless communication information, which is part of the foundation for how we communicate on a global basis now today. Welcome to a new Happy Learning video. Today, we're going to talk about some animals that existed 65 million years ago. I am sure you have heard about the dinosaurs. And I'm certain you have seen them in many films and cartoons featuring dinosaurs. But not everything that is told in these films is correct. So if you don't mind, let's find out what they are really like and how they lived. The first thing we need to understand is that people and dinosaurs never lived together. The dinosaurs lived before human beings existed and they roamed the earth for approximately 135 million years. That's a really long time. They were the dominating vertebrates. Nowadays, more than 500 different species have been identified, thanks to bones and fossils found. All dinosaurs were oviparous, meaning they reproduced by laying eggs. But there were huge differences between them. Some were very small, while others were absolutely enormous. Who was the better inventor, Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla, and why? The better inventor was hands down Edison. He had so many patents and inventions. Our best hope for induction and wireless charging is Nikola Tesla, and I hope that'll be the way of the future. I'm on Edison's team. I am on team Tesla. Edison, Edison rocks. rocks! I'm on team Nikola Tesla. Tesla, Edison, I mean, it's a great question. When you look at innovation and you look at competition and you look at rivalries, I think it is that type of um, competitive spirit that drives us forward. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla are two different types of inventors. Edison really was a businessman at heart. You really had to dig into the nuts and bolts of whatever it was you were inventing so that you could make it into a commercial, marketable product. Edison's breakthrough was to conceive of this as not just the light bulb, but as a system. Nikola Tesla has developed technologies for the transmission of alternating current electricity, which brought electrical power to households. He brought to light wireless communication information, which is part of the foundation for how we communicate on a global basis now today. I like both Edison and Tesla. I think they were pretty fantastic scientists and inventors. I suspect because there's controversy, they must be pretty close to equal. 
um, and that's exciting. A lot of people want to know who is the better inventor, Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla. And I have to say neither one because they were so different as inventors. Tesla and Edison, they're just both great inventors in the energy space. And what we're seeing sort of in lighting and electric motors is just another. This is a trunk sewer which carries all the human waste from the city I live in to be processed and converted back into quote unquote natural gas that we use. Harvesting us on multiple levels, our energy, our bodies, and what comes out of our bodies it is all a resource. The natural gas that we use is our own gas. So they make sure they feed us the right stuff in the grocery stores. So that we, uh, produce the right output. And they get what they want out of our natural gas. Nice big walls. They don't want us in there. Over there. Making the electricity. All the masts harvesting it. So it makes sense that where they're harvesting our 
our wastes and converting our waste into natural gas energy selling it right back to us it makes sense that electricity is being produced right across the river right across the river Flying animals, what do you think of? Birds, butterflies, or bees might first come to mind. But what about spiders? Even though they don't have wings, it turns out that spiders are actually some of nature's best aviators. So how do spiders take to the skies? Lightning storms are one of nature's most powerful displays of Earth's electricity. But even under normal weather conditions, electricity is all around us. The atmosphere holds a positive electric charge, while Earth's surface holds a negative charge. Just like with magnets, similar charges repel away from each other and opposite charges attract. This interaction creates something called an electric field. The force of this electric field is what allows for some spiders to defy gravity in a remarkable behavior called ballooning. It typically begins at high pointy areas where the Earth's electric field is the strongest. First, a spider drops an anchor silk to secure itself. Then, it raises its two front legs in the air and uses special fine hairs to sense wind and electrical conditions. Sort of like a built-in weather station. If the conditions are right, the spider then tiptoes on its back legs, raises its abdomen, and releases its silk to the air. The silk strands are charged, which causes them to repel away from each other rather than tangling. This form of static electricity is just like what happens to your hair after rubbing it with a balloon. Now, ready to set sail, the spider breaks off its anchor line and lifts into the air using the force it gains from the electric field and wind. Once airborne, spiders likely use their legs to balance or control speed during their dangerous journey. Most of these trips are short, but some can last for thousands of miles Time scientists assume that, like kites, ballooning spiders can fly because their silken threads generate enough lift to ride currents of air. But according to a study published in Current Biology this week by researchers at the University of Bristol in the UK, they don't actually need a breeze at all. It turns out spiders can fly using the electricity in our atmosphere.
the mystery of how spiders can fly for thousands of miles even in the complete absence of wind has finally been solved. Sometimes, when it rains or when they feel the urge to migrate, spiders get out the little silk knapsacks and balloon away. This ballooning behavior is well understood by spider scientists, but researchers have recently discovered that electric fields can not only trigger the behavior, but also provide lift. The latest research shows arachnids can make use of electrostatic charges in the atmosphere to power their journeys. This force, known as the E-field, can be detected by many insects and is used by honeybees to communicate with a hive. They travel via the atmospheric potential gradient, an electric circuit between Earth and the ionosphere, the part of Earth's upper atmosphere that's ionized by solar radiation. Sensory hairs called trichobothria are found on the surface of the spider's exoskeletons move in response to electric fields. This suggested spiders can feel the charge in the air using the same sensory hairs used to detect a breeze. Many spiders balloon using multiple strands of silk that splay out in a fan-like shape, which suggests that there must be a repelling electrostatic force involved. For a long time, scientists assumed that, like kites, ballooning spiders can fly because their silken threads generate enough lift to ride currents of air. But according to a study published in Current Biology this week by researchers at the University of Bristol in the UK, they don't actually need a breeze at all. It turns out spiders can fly using the electricity in our atmosphere. Hey guys, I'm just out looking for satellites and can never seem to see any. Uh, everything that we're told through the media tells us that we're surrounded by them and they're all out in space. But, you know, as I've Kind of been on this journey of trying to figure out how far away the moon is seeming that it's closer than we're told i would think that we would be able to see satellites whizzing between us and the moon at a constant rate um you know all the pictures that you you know google or whatever server you use you bring up shows you that there's all these satellites out there and that we're surrounded by them and so we should be able to see them but what I think is the reason we can't see them 
is because they're inside of the Earth's atmosphere. The moon is much closer than we're told and um, makes me question, you know, what space is in general. So, satellites, if they are real, are they just turbine-driven free energy engines that are um, inside the Earth's atmosphere? I don't know. They look like them. They look like turbines. The coolest idea I've heard recently for ion engines is the idea of an air-breathing engine under development by the European Space Agency. Instead of carrying any propellant at all, engineers at ESA demonstrated that a spacecraft in low Earth orbit should be able to pull in molecules of air right from the atmosphere and then ionize them and blast them back out. Since the spacecraft would be using unlimited solar electricity for power and pulling its propellant from the atmosphere, it could operate without refueling essentially forever. Spacecraft could operate at lower altitudes and space stations could remain in low Earth orbit indefinitely without needing to be reboosted. It's going to be a real game changer. People always ask me why we're stuck with chemical rockets. Seriously, exploding a bunch of hydrogen or kerosene is the best that we can do? Good news, there are other exotic science fiction sounding propulsion systems out there which use electromagnetic fields to accelerate atoms allowing their spacecraft to accelerate for months at a time. I'm talking about ion engines of course and several spacecraft have already used these exotic thrusters to perform some of the most amazing missions in the exploration of the solar system. There are other ways ion thrusters can be scaled up. NASA is testing a high thrust version of ion engines known as the X3 Hall thruster. This engine is capable of blasting out ions and produces 5.4 newtons of force. Again, not much, but remember that previous thrusters top out in the thousands of newtons. I said that ion engines produce very little thrust but there are some ideas to boost their output. The first is dramatically increase the amount of electricity that you're using to accelerate the ions. Instead of solar panels, NASA considered creating an ion engine powered by a nuclear reactor. Greatest machines that push air is the jet engine. Jet engines suck air in the front and push a jet of air out the back. That force is called thrust and it moves an airplane through the sky. Let's see how it works. A big fan at the front of the engine pulls air around the engine and sucks air into the core. We'll come back to that outside air in a moment. For now, let's follow the air in the core. It goes into a compressor, something like many household fans joined together. Each fan gets smaller and smaller as the blades squeeze the air into a tighter and tighter space, compressing the air like you would squeeze a balloon. The turbine is like a windmill that scoops up energy from the heated air and spins the shaft connected to the fan at the front of the engine. The excess hot air from the combustor blows out the back of the engine producing thrust. Remember that air rushing outside the engine core? Together, the turbine and fan push a larger mass of air than the core ever can for much more thrust. But that extra air passing around the engine core works more efficiently if it moves more slowly than the hot air rushing out the combustor and the back of the engine.
The coolest idea I've heard recently for ION engines is the idea of an air-breathing engine under development by the European Space Agency. Instead of carrying any propellant at all, engineers at ESA demonstrated that a spacecraft in low Earth orbit should be able to pull in molecules of air right from the atmosphere and then ionize them and blast them back out. Since the spacecraft would be using unlimited solar electricity for power and pulling its propellant from the atmosphere, it could operate without refueling, essentially forever. Spacecraft could operate at lower altitudes and space stations could remain in low Earth orbit indefinitely without needing to be reboosted. It's going to be a real game changer. A 550 metric ton Falcon Heavy is carrying almost 400 tons of fuel and oxidizer. The first stage will only burn for 162 seconds and the second stage will fire for 397 seconds. That gives you a total burn time of about 9.5 minutes. Want to make some maneuvers? Want to accelerate for days, weeks, or even months? Too bad, you are out of fuel. Of course, these shortcomings from chemical rockets have led scientists to search for other forms of propulsion, especially when you're out in space, and one of the most successful so far is the ion thruster. When you're working out the rocket equation, an important factor is the velocity that you're ejecting your propellant. The most efficient chemical rocket can throw hot gases out the back at five kilometers per second. Ion engines, on the other hand, can eject individual atoms 90 kilometers a second. This high velocity gives the spacecraft a much more efficient acceleration. The best chemical rockets see a fuel efficiency of about 35%, while ion engines see an efficiency of 90%. So how do ion thrusters work? It's actually pretty weird and totally sounds like science fiction. Instead of hot gases, ion thrusters eject ions, which are atoms or molecules which have an electrical charge because they've lost or gained an electron. In the case of an ion engine, they're emitting positively charged ions which have lost an electron. Once you've got ions, you can direct them with a magnetic field, accelerating them into space at tremendous speeds. So where do they get all the ions? The thrusters create them by generating a plasma inside the spacecraft, and they bombard neutral propellant atoms of some gas like xenon with electrons. These collisions release even more electrons from the propellant, turning them into positively charged ions. This plasma soup of electrons and positively charged ions has an overall neutral charge. The electrons are held in the chamber, leading to more ionizing events, while the positive ions are siphoned out through a grid at the end of the chamber. As they pass through this grid, high voltage accelerates them out the back of the spacecraft at speeds of up to 90 kilometers per second. For each ionized particle that the spacecraft can kick out, it gets a tiny kick in return. The whole system is powered by solar panels, so the spacecraft itself doesn't need to carry any kind of battery or power system, minimizing the total weight that it has to carry. The big problem is that the kick really is tiny. The thrust of ion engines is measured in millinewtons, like thousandths of a newton. Hold a piece of paper in your hand. That's the kind of forces involved. But they can operate for days, weeks, even months, accelerating and accelerating long after chemical rockets would have run out of fuel. So if you're already out of the gravity well of a planet, they're very efficient engines for dramatic changes in velocity. NASA and other space agencies have actually used ion engines very successfully in a range of missions. They've been developing this thruster concept for decades, but were never willing to risk it on an active mission where a failure could end it. So NASA gathered up a bunch of these risky technologies and packaged them together as the Deep Space One mission, which launched in 1998. Deep Space One was equipped with 12 different technologies that NASA wanted to test out, including low power electronics, solar concentrator arrays, various scientific instruments, and a solar electric propulsion system.
Birds don't fly tree to tree, they sail, finding the next power station to charge. They're not resting, they're charging, collecting the electrical charge from the trees for flight. Our history will be what we make of it. And if there are any historians about 50 or 100 years from now, and there should be preserved the kinescopes of one week of all three networks, they will there find, recorded in black and white and in color, evidence of decadence, escapism, and insulation from the realities of the world in which we live. We are currently wealthy, fat, comfortable, and complacent. We have a built-in allergy to unpleasant or disturbing information. Our mass media reflect this. But unless we get up off our fat surpluses and recognize that television in the main is being used to distract, delude, amuse, and insulate us, then television and those who finance it, those who look at it, and those who work at it may see a totally different picture too late.
guess what? Guess what? It is a big secret. Air traffic control towers are harvesting free energy. Just like the towers that were used and squashed, but they weren't. They're being used today. Energy is free. Energy is being harvested out of the atmosphere. Airports are designed just like motherboards. They're designed to harvest free energy. Um, creating the frequency needed for their, their turbines to work. Runways are set up in very specific directions to uh, harvest that frequency needed. They need this intake, they need this compression, they need this resonation, but they do not need fuel. They do not fly with liquid fuel. That's one of the big secrets. Tell us they fill all these airplane wings, jet wings, with all that fuel. And right here, they show you it's air. Air. These jokers, these jokers. And why would they be fueling a wing up into? It from the bottom that makes no sense liquid falls <laughs> you know what he has sunglasses on here no eye protection no arm protection all this fuel being pumped into this wing supposedly <clears throat> not protecting himself at all Meanwhile, right back here, they're telling you it's air. It's air that is flying these planes. Compression. You know, the cabin compresses so the plane can levitate. That's the real zero, zero gravity. So, if they've hoaxed us about 9-11 and hoaxed us about jet fuel all this fuel being in the wings if that's not possible if jets fly on free energy it proves that 9-11 staged if that's not jet fuel burning because jets don't use fuel. Not elevens busted. Free energy is the big secret.
just a quick little video on helicopters and how they are able to fly, levitate, resonate, without the rotary blades spinning. They use they use a turbine turbine engine. That's it. Pull the air through that turbine. Resonate. The helicopters don't fly; they levitate. These turbines are designed to take fresh electrical air out of the troposphere and compress it, resonate it into frequencies that turn it into a fuel. These, these planes fly with free energy engines. That's why this is such a, a, like an important subject because it's one of the biggest hoaxes they're pulling on us. You know, they charge us for fuel when they're not using it. It hides a, a free energy engine that could be used, you know, to solve the quote unquote energy crisis. I mean, imagine if we had a free energy engine that we could use for everything that just use the air that would solve the if it's made up or not or whatever the energy crisis another another thing that it hoaxes us on is, is it's like if there's no fuel used in jet engines then there was no fuel burning on 911 dudes so, right, <laughs> kills that whole thing too.
Our history will be what we make of it. And if there are any historians about 50 or 100 years from now, and there should be preserved the kinescopes of one week of all three networks, they will there find, recorded in black and white and in color, evidence of decadence, escapism, and insulation from the realities of the world in which we live. We are currently wealthy, fat, comfortable, and complacent. We have a built-in allergy to unpleasant or disturbing information. Our mass media reflect this. But unless we get up off our fat surpluses and recognize that television in the main is being used to distract, delude, amuse, and insulate us, then television and those who finance it, those who look at it, and those who work at it may see a totally different picture too late.
conclusion. Industries that operate above the general population of populists. Gasoline-driven cars are sold to the general population to create the illusion that liquid fuel is being used in the industries that operate above the general population. Don't use liquid fuel. They use compressed air. And these turbines are designed to pull in air and compress it and combust it and use it as fuel. Thank you. 
Fuel tanks with the gypsy aircraft. Helium tanks. The ability and right. the tanks. And so those, they can drop those off. The big, the big, the big one underneath. Yes, he feels like a lot. He's got a lot of gas. And that's extra fuel. And they fuel it up on top. You know, there's a... Or the sun, the moon, the moon, the moon, the moon, the moon, the Liquid fuel. 
Most commonly seen as gas, but under certain conditions, we can see it as liquid. It is actually the temperature and the pressure that determines whether something will exist as a gas, a solid, or a liquid. In the atmospheric pressure that we live in, oxygen is a gas, but if we increase the pressure enough or lower the temperature enough, we can put it back into a liquid or even a solid. This can be pretty easily visualized in a graph, which is known as a phase diagram. At home, putting something under extreme pressure is kind of hard and dangerous, but cooling it down is much easier and safer. The boiling point of liquid oxygen is slightly higher than liquid nitrogen. Free energy machines. They've been around for hundreds of years. Helium is abundant. We don't need helium. But we do. So the astronauts. Hey guys, I'm just out looking for satellites and can never seem to see any. Uh, everything that we're told through the media tells us 
that we're surrounded by them and they're all out in space. But, you know, as I've kind of been on this journey of trying to figure out how far away the moon is, seeming that it's closer than we're told, I would think that we would be able to see satellites whizzing between us and the moon at a constant rate. Um, you know, all the pictures that you, you know, Google or whatever server you use, you bring up, shows you that there's all these satellites out there and that we're surrounded by them. And So we should be able to see him. But what I think is the reason we can't see them is because they're inside of the Earth's atmosphere. The moon is much closer than we're told and um, makes me question, you know, what space is in general. So, satellites, if they are real, are they just turbine-driven free energy engines that are um, inside the Earth's atmosphere? Ships don't use liquid fuel. They use compressed air. And these turbines are designed to pull in air and compress it and combust it and use it as fuel. I come in, um, and at this point, I've kind of forgotten that I don't have a nose gear. I'm just focused on landing. That's what I decided I had to do. So I'm at 20 feet, say wise, and I can't see. We can overstand! Don't use liquid fuel. They use compressed air. And these turbines are designed to pull in air and compress it and combust it. I do not use this fuel.
interesting atmosphere. Electricity. Show you guys how similar motherboards are to cities. When I get up nice and close like that. It's hard to tell where the motherboard ends and the city begins. There's uh, the electrical mass harnessing atmospheric electricity. Taking alternating current and converting it into direct current. They tell us. <laughs> Tell us, right? Hopefully, it's Death on Electric City. Electricity. Electric city. They're all set up like motherboards to harvest and conduct energy. Throughout history, energy has been abundant and free. It's been harvested by ancient civilizations at a certain point there was a catastrophe a mud flood and all of this technology was buried but there were a few survived and walked away with this knowledge of free energy. Earth is a simulation. being harvested. you guys how similar motherboards are to cities. When I get up nice and close like that, it's hard to tell where the motherboard ends and the city begins.
is not up. Earth is not down. Earth is not a globe. Earth is not a plane. Earth is a motherboard and an electrically generated simulation.